Good afternoon, and welcome to the Economic Development Committee of the New York City Council. Uh, my name is Dan Gorodnik, and I have the privilege of co-chairing this hearing along with my fellow council members, Debbie Rose, uh, who is the chair of the Committee on Waterfronts, uh, and Yudanis Rodriguez, the chair of the Committee on Transportation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, both of my co-chairs, as well as the members of all three committees, for coming together to hold this hearing today. New York City boasts one of the most efficient and robust transportation systems in the world. As a city, we strive to meet the ongoing public demands on our transportation system, a system that operates at all hours of the day and night to accommodate the city that never sleeps. And we always endeavor to do more. Prior to the existence of the many subways, buses, roadways, bridges, tunnels, and tramways that exist in New York, consistent and reliable ferry service was a critical means of connecting the five boroughs. Over time, the ferry system fell by the wayside, and these newer forms of transportation became the means for most New Yorkers to, commu to commute to destinations across the East River. But now, thanks to unyielding support from many ferry advocates and the mayor and many members of the council, we again have a functional citywide ferry system known as NYC Ferry. NYC Ferry launched three routes this summer, connecting to landings in Astoria, South Brooklyn, and the Rockaways, and acquired the existing route offered on the East River Ferry. Two more routes are set to launch next summer, including connections to Long Island City and to Soundview. In the future, there may be further routes to Canarsie, Coney Island, and even LaGuardia Airport. While the launch of NYC Ferry has been widely heralded as a success in expanding the city's transit system, it has not come without, without some significant growing pains, mostly as a result of the system's success exceeding ridership expectations. EDC's original estimates for ferry ridership anticipated one million riders by late August, when in fact NYC Ferry reached that number in July. As a result, there were many complaints from riders this summer who were forced to wait up to two hours after being denied access to ferries at capacity. Most of the ferries used can accommodate up to 150 passengers, but in light of the unanticipated demand, NYC Ferry was forced to lease two additional boats this summer from NYC Waterways with a capacity for 400 people at the cost of $60,000 each weekend. When taxpayers are already subsidizing this service at around $6.60 per passenger to keep rides at parity with the MTA fares, uh, we shouldn't be adding to that number due to the city's inability to anticipate demand. Additionally, there have been some concerns about the shipyards hired to manufacture these ferries, one of which now appears to be on the verge of bankruptcy. While the terms of that shipyard's contract are not strictly the responsibility of EDC, the committees nonetheless think a more thorough review here should be warranted uh, to ensure that this particular vendor uh, was able to meet its contract obligations and also that we have the ability to satisfy them. We want to ensure that the ferry system does not become a victim of its own success, but rather continues to thrive. We have already seen increased property values and growth in the areas served by the ferries. We applaud the impact that this ferry service is having on these communities, and we look forward to the benefits that future routes will bring. We have questions for EDC on how to address some of the ongoing issues related to ferry service, as well as about the expansion plans in place for next summer and into the future. Uh, before I turn the floor over to my co-chair, uh, Debbie Rose, I want to note we've been joined by Council Members Vaca and Borelli. Uh, and I want to thank my committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson, Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali, and my Legislative Director Leah Reese for their hard work putting this hearing together. Um, with that, Chair Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair Gorodnik. And good afternoon, and um, welcome to this hearing. My name is Debbie Rose, and I'm the chair of the City Council's Waterfront Committee. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Council Member Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the Economic Development Committee, and Council Member Yudanis Rodriguez, the Chair of the Transportation Committee, for agreeing to hold this hearing jointly. 
I'd like to welcome the administration, advocates, and members of the public to our hearing, which will focus on examining the implementation of the new comprehensive ferry system. Plans to expand ferry service throughout the five boroughs have been around since 2011. Comprehensive ferry study, since the 2011 comprehensive ferry study, which resulted in the development of the East River Ferry. The East River Ferry has proven to be a success. So building off that success, Mayor de Blasio announced the city ferry study of 2013 to plan for a new citywide ferry network. The study found that various areas of the city had the potential to support new ferry routes while being economically efficient with little public subsidy. The plan then evolved into the NYC ferry system with five planned new routes in addition to those already in operation. The Astoria, South Brooklyn, and Rockaway routes began operating in 2017, and the South Soundview and Lower East Side routes are to begin service in 2018. It is expected that 4.6 million rides per year will occur when it is fully operational. While I applaud the plan to provide new routes to Astoria, South Brooklyn, and the Rockaways, Soundview and the Lower East Side, as a member representing parts of Staten Island, I want to make sure that we're not forgotten as well. I'm interested in learning what were the metrics used by EDC to determine where the proposed routes would be located and why Staten Island has still not yet figured into this plan, a five borough plan that doesn't include five boroughs is um, a sort of an enigma to me. There were talks when the plan was initially announced that there was a possibility of adding a sixth proposed route that would have connected Stapleton, Staten Island, and Coney Island with Manhattan at some point in the future. I'd like to see some more definitive talk regarding this proposed route to see it come to fruition at some point in the near future, rather than be referenced as an abstract idea. And there's also um, a proposal for the South Shore of Staten Island to have a ferry. With the rise of ferry ridership, a supplement to the Staten Island Ferry makes sense for numerous reasons, especially since transportation options from Staten Island to the rest of the city are so limited and increased car traffic all over the island, which continues to be a major problem and needs to be mitigated by additional modes of public transportation such as additional ferry sites along the South Shore. I certainly hope that we revisit this plan as it relates to equipping this area of the city, which has always been starved for efficient public transportation options. So far, the new ferry routes have be, been receiving good reviews, but there are additional outstanding concerns, which I hope this hearing will clear up for the council. Some of those include what the plans are for addressing overcrowding issues, the financial health of Hornblower as it relates to issues regarding their subcontractors, whether the administration will seek out other funding streams aside from the city, and to add to the operating support the new routes receive, that the new routes will receive, and the future plans to fully integrate the fare structure with the rest of the city's public transportation via MetroCard. I hope that this hearing will provide more insight regarding the complexities and potential benefits of NYC Ferry so that we can ensure that this system develops into a success for all New Yorkers. I want to thank the chair again. I want to welcome you. And I want to thank um, council committee staff, Chris Sartori and Patrick Mulvihill for their help in preparing for this committee hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. I want to note we've been joined by Councilmember Constantinidis. And with that, we're going to turn to uh, the first panel today, which includes Justine Johnson of EDC, James Wong of EDC, and Seth Myers of EDC. So welcome. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, please proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs Gorodnik, Rose Rodriguez, and members of the Committees on Economic Development, Waterfronts, and Transportation. My name is Seth Myers, and I serve as the Director of Project Implementation at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, or EDC. I'm joined by my colleagues James Wong, Vice President of Ports and Transportation, and Justine Johnson, 
Vice President, Government and Community Relations. I'm pleased to testify today about the positive economic impacts of NYC Ferry and how it is helping to better connect New Yorkers and the city's waterfront neighborhoods. In February 2015, Mayor de Blasio announced the creation of NYC Ferry, the first major expansion of ferry service in more than a century. Its goal was, and remains, to provide an equitable transportation option for New Yorkers living in areas that have long been underserved by existing public transportation. The system will also support housing development, job creation, and neighborhood growth by connecting job opportunities and new innovation clusters with existing and emerging residential communities. Since Mayor de Blasio's announcement in his 2015 State of the City Address, EDC has been working to bring the system to life under a very rapid timeline. We're proud of our role in launching such an ambitious project. We officially inaugurated ferry service on Monday, May 1, 2017, the culmination of over two years of hard work, including environmental review, selection of the operator, extensive community engagement, and construction of the new landings. Today, we have four routes in operation, East River, South Brooklyn, Rockaway, and Astoria. The Soundview and Lower East Side routes are expected to launch next summer, which will bring the total number of routes to six. When fully operational, NYC Ferry's fleet will include 20 vessels and will carry an estimated 4.6 million passengers annually. We knew that NYC Ferry would be well used but customer demand has exceeded even our expectations. Only six months after NYC Ferry launched, the system has seen over two million riders. That's about two months ahead of when we expected to reach that number. Preliminary data shows that every weekday, approximately 7,200 people ride the East River route, 2,700 people ride the Astoria route, and there are about 2,400 daily trips on the Rockaway and South Brooklyn routes, respectively. In a recent customer, uh, customer satisfaction survey scaled from 1 to 10, 93% of riders gave the system a satisfactory rating of 7 or higher. But neither the high ridership nor the high satisfaction rate just happened. In order to obtain these results, EDC conducted a number of studies and pilot projects over several years that helped us determine where best to place landings, routes, and service. In 2011, we completed the comprehensive citywide ferry study which provided an overview of development potential for ferry transportation across New York City. The study analyzed potential routes drawn from over 40 waterfront sites throughout the five boroughs. To build on that study, we launched several ferry initiatives, including the implementation of the pilot for the East River Ferry Service in 2011. Following the success of the East River Ferry pilot, EDC set out to complete an expanded citywide ferry study. The, goal of the, study, the goals of the study were to identify new ferry service opportunities and to increase understanding of the economic impacts and potential of this old but new transportation resource. The study analyzed the viability of 58 locations throughout the five boroughs for commuter ferry service. We then estimated the potential ridership for the 35 most promising locations and began grouping them into potential route configurations. The study also looked at the benefits to users, economic development, and how it could complement or fill in, at least in part, for the existing transit system. I'll summarize the detailed conclusion of the study by saying, in short, it confirmed that user benefits would justify the investment required for the system. Moreover, the expansion of ferry service would fill a critical need for redundancy in the transportation network, have a positive impact on real estate values, and would overall generate wider economic <coughs> benefits for New York City. Of course, bringing NYC Ferry to life required public investment, and like every form of mass transit, would require a public subsidy to operate. Equity and accessibility is a fundamental objective of the system, highlighted by our fare being in line with those charged for a ride on the subway. To date, EDC has allocated 59 million of capital costs for ferry infrastructure. This allocation includes funding for 10 new barges, gangways, and other necessary capital infrastructure. 96 million for vessels, including the purchase and upgrade of existing, uh, four existing boats from the East River Ferry Fleet, and $41 million for the build out of the home port facility at the Brooklyn Navy Yard for the NYC Ferry Fleet. To bring this system to life, we've coordinated with several sister agencies, such as the Department of Transportation, Parks and Recreation, Small Business Services, and the Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities, among many others. We built relationships 
with federal regulatory partners, such as the Army Corps of Engineers and the United States Coast Guard, and state partners like the Department of Environmental Conservation, who we worked with for permits to build ferry landings in a safe and responsible manner. We completed over 350 briefings with stakeholders to ensure a successful implementation of NYC Ferry, including federal and local elected officials, regulatory partners, community boards and civic organizations, recreational boaters, and both public and private waterfront property owners. These efforts paid off. In addition to meeting a critical transportation need and moving over two million travelers, the launch of NYC Ferry has created 262 living wage jobs, many of which were sourced through Hire NYC, for building, operating, and maintaining the system. That's also the result of working hard to build a home port here in New York City at the Brooklyn Navy Yard instead of relying on service that would, without that investment, in all likelihood remain based outside of the city. While NYC Ferry has enjoyed tremendous success to date, it has not been without challenges. On Tuesday, May 2nd, which was the second day of our operations, an oil spill unrelated to NYC Ferry shut down much of the East River, causing delays for commuters. This summer, two presidential visits and the UN General Assembly also shut down the East River intermittently, delaying ferry service. Through the NYC Ferry app, social media, and digital displays at landings, we were able to communicate unexpected service changes to our customers in the most efficient manner possible. And despite those high satisfaction scores I mentioned, we know there's a need for more improvement and we'll work relentlessly to achieve it. We know things did not go perfectly this summer. On peak summer days, particularly weekends, the demand of riders exceeded the supply of seats on ferry boats, resulting at times in long lines and waits to get on board. Though we see this as a testament to NYC Ferry's success and the latent demand for this transit system, we acknowledge that this problem must be solved. And we set to work immediately to respond to that high demand, deploying additional and spare vessels and supplemental service and charter additional vessels throughout the system to better meet this high demand and increase capacity. We continue to collect data and monitor the system to inform decisions and have committed to investing in larger capacity boats which we expect to have operating in the harbor by next summer. To conclude, we're encouraged by NYC Ferry's initial success and are fully committed to making investments to support the system's growth and safe, safe operation. We're actively addressing issues that have arisen since the launch and will continue to survey riders to optimize customer experience as well as work with the adjacent communities and their leadership. EDC looks forward to continuing to work with the city, the city council, on this transformative project that has helped New York reclaim its waterways and empower citizens with another mode of transportation. Thank you very much for your time and attention. My colleagues and I are happy to take any questions that you may have. Great, thank you very much. I want to note we have been joined uh, by Chair Rodriguez, Council Member Johnson, and I want to give uh, Chair Rodriguez an opportunity to, uh, uh, to give a brief opening and then we were going to get right into the questions. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair, and I'm sorry I couldn't be here on time. I would like to thank Chairman Garani and Rose for their collaboration in holding this very important hearing. As Chairman of the Transportation Committee, I'm glad we had the opportunity today to examine one of the newest transportation network in our city, the citywide ferry system, also known as the New York City Ferry. As a city of islands, it makes sense to maximize the use of our city's water weight for transportation. Our rivers and harbor played a large role in establishing New York City as a national and global center of commerce and industry. The New York City Ferry Program is one way we are re-engaging with the history and reimagining re uh, what a water-borne uh, transportation should look like in the 21st century. This project takes on even more urgency at a time when our, not, our, our traditional public transportation system is uh, struggling to keep up with a booming city. Our subway system is uh, straining with overcrowding and delays. Our buses are uh, slogging and our streets are becoming more and more congested. Ferries like other alternatives form of transportation will never be able uh, to come anywhere close to being uh, the replacement of a mass transit system. They simply do not have the capacity 
and are naturally limited in where they can go. That's why we must keep fighting for the robust investment that is needed to improve our subways and buses in the buses system. If we expect to meet the need and expectation of New Yorkers for, for, uh, for, for to come, reliable transportation is very important in our city. We also have to understand that ferry can play an important role to supplement our core public transit system. We hope to hear more today from the city and from harm blower about the NYC ferries first six months in operation, how the operation has gone, and what the vision is for the future. We hope to find out more about plans to deal with capacity issues experienced during the services first few months, plans for expansion in more areas of the city, and effort to better integrate the system with the rest of the city transportation network, including a payment system that should allow riders to transfer from buses, trains, and bikes to ferry, and vice versa. We want to know about costs, both operating and capacity, and how we can make sure the service is sustainable for the long term. We also need to talk about expansion. Together with my colleagues, I have been requesting the Northern Manhattan Riverdale Bronze Ferry Services so that we can provide the services around the island of Manhattan. I already have allocated or got the support of Kristen Quinn to put $5 million to start building a new pier in the Dagman area. Nothing has to start happening with those $5 million. It is important to continue expanding in all the area. So I'd like to end again, thank you, the chairman, and hoping that you can answer our questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, okay, well, let's jump right into the, uh, the questions, and I'm gonna go to my colleagues in a couple of minutes. But to start it off, um, Mr. Myers, just to your testimony for the moment. Um, you had said that every weekday there were about 7,200 people who ride East River route, 2,700 who ride the Astoria route, and then you said that there are 2,400 daily trips on Rockaway and South Brooklyn. Are, are, are you making a distinction between people and trips in your testimony, or is it just a, were, were, was it just a, uh, you're being linguistically interesting? I was trying to be linguistically diverse. Okay, fine. Right. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna call them all people. Fair okay, so, it's, so if you add those up, it's 14,700 people who ride those four routes all together. Okay, uh, how about on uh, the weekend? Um, the, the weekend has seen generally um, higher levels on average. Um, can you give us those numbers? Um, the, the East River has had an average um, since, this is uh, I believe since, uh, since August, uh, of around 8,200 per weekend. Uh, the Rockaways has had uh, 3,600. South Brooklyn, an average of 4,000, and Astoria, uh, 3,700. Uh, it's important to note that these rolled out in somewhat of a staggered format. So this is, this is an average as of towards the end of the summer and should not be seen as reflective of how it's going to go uh, year-round or on an annual basis. This is going to skew towards probably a higher weekend ridership because many of these routes launch during the summer where you'd expect to see more discretionary trips. Okay, um, and you, you are able to measure the ridership by route, by day, by season. You have, you have all of that information broken down. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay, and you're measuring it by what, what means exactly? How, how do you capture your data? Um, we get a, a, primarily we get our information from our operator. We have other ways to verify that information, but we primarily get our ridership number from our operator as they do. They have to do counts per Coast Guard regulations on how many people board a vessel. So each time somebody sales. comes on the boat, they're, they're counting it. Is Correct. that accurate? Okay. Uh, because they can't go beyond a certain maximum amount. Correct. Okay. And the maximum amount on these boats, I know that there may be some slight different uh, differentiation between the boats, but for the, for the vast majority of the, boat, the boats, 
the maximum number is what? Uh, it's 150 people. Now, that is for how many of the boats is the maximum 150? Uh, there are 17 vessels in the, in the kind of future complete fleet that would be at 150 passengers capacity. Are, are there any vessels which have more than 150? We are, we are working to um, increase the capacity of three vessels, which we have ordered, um, but are in very early stages of construction to increase their capacity to carry, to be able to carry 350 passengers. And that's in response to the enormous success and, and high levels of ridership that we've seen this summer. We, we believe that we're going to need to have higher capacity vessels, so we, we're making that, that change. The three vessels that would have the capacity for 350 people, are they included in the group of 17, or is that something which would get us up to 20 vessels? It's, it's 17 at 150, three being increased to 350, that gets us to the 20 vessel fleet that I mentioned earlier. And those three uh, increased capacity vessels are expected to be here in the harbor for next summer. Okay. Uh, do you also measure, along with the number of passengers, do you also measure delays? We do uh, track how our system is performing, yes. So do you measure delays specifically? Like uh, the, the ferry was supposed to leave at 8.04, it's leaving at 8.17, and that, is, that information is captured some, somewhere? We, we do have a way to track. We have been bringing on um, uh, what we are, uh, a way to oversee this, and we do get reports from our operator. We are, we are at a very initial stage in launching this, and as we rolled out service this summer, uh, when we started seeing capacity, uh, demand that exceeded our capacity, we brought on supplemental vessels. What that did is um, we were running boats that may not have been scheduled, um, and by adding those additional vessels in, it, it has made it a little challenging for us immediately to evaluate exactly what our on-time percentage was and was not since we were running a great deal of unscheduled trips. James, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So with respect State to your name before you start. Sorry. Um, my name is James Wong um, with EDC. Um, and with respect to the on-time performance tracking, which you're talking about, one of the things that we wanted to start with uh, as we were designing NYC Ferry was really focusing on the need to make sure that we were creating a safe and efficient operation. So what we started with was a good understanding of what we wanted our route structures to be and the timings to be on each of these routes, but we also gave ourselves flexibility in the first several months with our operator to assess when we're uh, when our on-time performance is good and when we need to make small changes in order to accommodate additional loading time and things like that to assure, assure uh, ourselves that we aren't asking captains to drive vessels very quickly or faster than they should. So we've been focusing a lot on managing our schedules lately and so we've been making small changes uh, throughout the summer on each time that we've had to make a schedule change to help improve uh, our ability to stay on time. Okay. Uh what I hear you saying, and you can correct me if this is not a fair uh, way of describing it, is that um, you have a way to measure delays, but because of the, uh, the fluidity of where you've added boats, you have not been measuring delays. Where we've, that, where, we've both, where we've both added boats and modified our schedule, and likely as we introduce additional service and learn more about uh, uh, comprehensively operating all these different lines as part of a system may have to continue to modify uh, the schedules until we are completely aligned on both what our customers want as well as what the infrastructure can support in terms of making sure we do not create congestion uh, as we have kind of like an airport we have a limited number of, of runways or in our case berths that the vessels have to go to. Right, I understand. I, but you're not modifying the, the routes and adding boats every day or every week, you're, you're, you're locking in on a particular schedule a certain number of boats for, you know, at least a couple weeks or months or whatever before that, you make correct. changes. Is that correct? That's correct. So then, uh, what is your way of measuring uh, on-time performance during that period of, uh, of time when you are not adding anything or changing routes midstream? Uh, my expectation is that when we reach a steady state, we will be able to, and we are receiving um, uh, reports on, on how responsive our service is being, but when we reach a steady state where we're no longer modifying um, our, our route schedules and our, our fleet uh, alignment and assignment to, 
to different routes, we'll, we will we will be able to fully and transparently report all of our on time percentages to you. It's going to okay. be well. Let me let me just suggest to you that our customers. that knowing your on time percentages may aid you in determining where and when you might want to be adding routes. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, but it also seems like a, a worthwhile measurement to be doing even as you go. Okay, let me just ask a couple more before I go to my colleagues, which also now include Council Members Reynoso and Menchaca. Uh, uh, we have a couple of lines that are, you're expecting to uh, add in the summer of 2018. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And this is the Sound View and Lower East Side line, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, are, you, uh, are you on track? Uh, yes, sir. We're doing very well. We, are we, um, can we expect to be riding the Sound View and Lower East Side lines by, um, I don't know, tell me what the date is next summer that we should be expecting to enjoy these, uh, these routes? We do not have a specific date for the launch of the, those routes yet. We are still working through some of the early permitting stages that will really define how effectively can work. Uh, and then we'll be working with Hornblower and uh, assessing the delivery of the boats to determine an exact date, which we'll look forward to announcing. Okay. So um, is, it, is it fair for us to expect that it'll be done by Labor Day, though, at the end of the summer? That's how I would define summer. Uh, I don't know the exact date of No, summer I mean, summer officially like, ends on the 21st, we'll, we'll, probably we'll, we'll, September, we'll be, but like Labor Day is... I, I expect we'll be launching, yes, summer of 18. Okay. Yes. Um, and were there any... Uh, by the way, I, I think of... Uh, the, um, one of the stops on the Soundview route on, uh, in Stuyvesant Cove, um, you know, there's no, no physical work going on there at this time, even in uh, mid to late October of 2017. Um, at what point, you know, would one reasonably expect to see that work commence uh, to be able to activate a route by, say, Labor Day latest Jan uh, of 2018? Uh, there, there are several steps that we need to go through in order to get a landing built and operational. Um, it's going to really start with our ability to get permits, and some of the permit requirements uh, do limit our times that we can work, times of the year that we can work due to um, what's called a fish moratorium where we're not allowed to do in-water work while fish are breeding. Um, so there may be a, a several-month period uh, from the spring into the summer where we are actually not allowed to do in water work. So in some places we'll be starting uh, in, the, in this winter, uh, driving piles and bringing in barges, and that would be in, in advance of that fish moratorium. Uh, and then in other places we'll have to do it immediately following that moratorium. Um, but you should see actual physical signs of construction, uh, some, some piles being driven and barges being brought into place, um, perhaps some upland work on the adjacent uh, landside areas uh, that will connect onto those landings. Uh, this winter, and then uh, by the spring you may see completed or landings that appear to be complete, but then we are required to, as we get those, those vessels in the harbor, actually test, as James mentioned, start doing some time trials to make sure our uh, projections around the schedules are accurate, and then that all of the different um, components of the landing operate correctly so that we can make sure we have a, a safe ferry system. Okay, and specifically on, uh, on Stuyvesant Cove, uh, you expect, we should expect to see that work taking place this summer and preliminarily complete by spring. Is that accurate? We, we, will, we fully expect to have a Stuyvesant Cove landing that's, that's functional and operational this summer, yes. Okay, but that, was, that wasn't actually what I asked. I, I wanted to, to, to know when the work will be taking place I, in I don't order any, to activate that. I understand I don't have the, an exact the spawning date. of fish and things like that may happen Understood. spring, summer. But what I heard, what I heard you, you say was that the work will likely commence this winter. It would be, it will look complete by the time when there are environmental concerns by the spring, and then there's additional testing to make it fully operational by the go time. Is that is that accurate? That is that is correct across the system, uh, for the the new landings that we're putting in for 2018. I do not have the specific schedule in front of me. I'm happy to follow up with you okay. uh, around each of the landings and when. Yeah, I, actually, when I we'll think that would be that would be useful for for the, all the right. folks who have. Uh, those sorts of uh, stops in their district. Um, uh, last question for me for the moment is um, you've now had the experience of rolling out Astoria, South Brooklyn, and Rockaway. Uh, are there lessons uh, on rollout that you can take from those experiences that you will apply to a sound view and Lower East Side that may uh, aid the functionality or smooth operations right right from the start? Are there things that you learned there that you will apply, and what are those things? 
I think we learned a, a great deal and we're uh, fortunate to be able to respond quickly working with our operator to them. I think um, a great deal of this is about the ability to respond and respond effectively to capacity. I don't know, James, if you want to share any more thoughts about what we learned. Sure. Um, in general, I know that <clears throat> we really benefit from having the time to go through early testing and making sure, um, to Seth's point, on having landings in place long before service is actually starting and having the opportunity to work and see how each of these landings is operating, what the small intricacies are with each one. Um, one of the things we also learned in launch procedures is making sure that we have plenty of staff on the ground through our operator. They are very good now at making sure that there's uh, ample staff on the ground uh, to help customers in their early days, making sure we have the right kind of uh, support within our own organization to make sure that we're paying a lot of attention during those very first days while we're really helping to educate communities and, in fact, the uh, working with our uh, commuters who are using the system. All right, thank you. We've been also been joined by uh, Councilmember Barron, and we're going to now go to uh, Chair Rose for questions, followed by Chair Rodriguez for questions. Thank you, Chair Gorodnik. Um, hi. Hello. This is like one of my favorite subjects. Um, you know, having grown up on Staten Island, an island, um, a major mode of transportation for most of my growing up years were ferries. We had five. And um, we live on, on an island that, is, that has, is a transportation desert. And um, my colleague, Joe Borelli, um, I'm sure will agree, we have some of the longest commutes to um, get into Manhattan. I was really excited to see that the administration recognized the value of using the waterways, you know, as a blue highway. And um, I was really disappointed to find that initially we were included in the five borough plan, um, but to be later omitted. So um, as Staten Island continues to go unmentioned um, in terms of the five borough, which is minus one, borough ferry plan, um, in terms of New York City ferry routes. Could you tell me what metrics were used to determine the locations and the routes of the new, ferry, the new ferries? And how did Staten Island locations like uh, St. George, Stapleton, um, the South Shore, measure up in, this, in those metrics that you used? And um, um, yeah. I'd be delighted to answer that, Council Member. Thank um, you. When we, when we launched our 2013 study, we did examine almost 60 sites across the city, uh, including a, a, a great number in, in Staten Island that we looked at extensively. We evaluated the ability to whether we thought it would be feasible to introduce ferry service based on the levels of ridership that we could estimate and based on the travel time and how competitive the ferry service would be versus other modes and then the cost of that of that service and if it would be something that we thought we could uh, feasibly and sustainably deliver um, there's a there was a great deal of, of time and attention spent on several of those sites in staten island um, james you want to dig into those a little more and some of the details around our findings Sure. I mean, uh, as Seth was mentioning just on uh, briefly on process, it is looking at journey to work data, where people live, where they work, um, and, and looking at those travel time savings. Um, and I think in general, we were looking through the various options, both on the north and south shore of Staten Island. Um, and ultimately, when we, uh, the idea of Stapleton was one that had started, began to surface uh, early on. Now, while that's not part of the rollout of these five routes, what we are learning a great deal about is how these systems are operating and, in fact, where we can go in the future. So one of the things that's really important that for us is to be able to take the information that we're learning about the current operations of this system and apply that in the future as we explore other locations. So once we are able to get these routes up and running, we're very much looking forward with an open mind as to where we want to look at in the future for different kinds of services and where it's going to be able to work best. So, um, so when you did a comparative of uh, time saving um, cost and routes, I, I guess the distance and the routes, 
Staten Island wasn't competitive. We weren't ranked high in in, in that list. I, I think there are uh, several functions that that, um, that that raise challenges in our study. One is the population density in many areas uh, of Staten Island, uh, where with an increase like some of the development that EDC is working on, uh, thanks to in great part to your leadership. Um, uh, we, we expect that there could be that level of density um, in the foreseeable future. Um, and other times it's, it's the travel distance that makes it challenging to get there. Um, but as James said, you know, we're, we've been committed to launching these current routes and then after we have launched those, taking some of those lessons learned and uh, doing another round of studies to evaluate the ability to do any future expansions. So density always seems to be um, sort of the elephant in the room although um, I don't understand whether you look at the number of people who are employed off of Staten Island in terms of, of that number that you're working with. And so I guess you've never listened to the traffic report and heard that the Staten Island Expressway was backed up for hours and it, the commute is very long. Um, and so I, I just want, one, and you added a sixth system in. You're, you're going to now do Soundview and Canarsie. We're going to do, next year we're going to be doing Soundview in the Lower East Side. And the Lower East Side. So is there some sort of timeline, time frame um, that Staten Island can look forward to? us actually seeing a ferry service being there? Because we meet the metrics. You, you're, you don't deny that we um, meet the, the guidelines for ferry service, right? We are, we are happy to sit down and walk back through our analysis. There were, um, we, and, and there's no doubt that there is a great need for transit improvements. I'm, I'm not in a place where I can tell you that ferries are anything approaching the single solution to Staten Island's transit needs or that it would have a great impact on highway uh, congestion. But um, you know, we, are, we are committing to launch the current routes that we have planned and then uh, embark on a study to evaluate the expansion of it and the expansion, expansion potential. And we're happy to go um, you know, speak further with you about exactly what, what worked and what did not appear feasible uh, in that study. If I was snarky, I would say, you know, um, since we're not getting a ferry, then the subway line that we were promised we, you know, should look forward to, or the tunnel. <laughs> but I won't be snarky. So um, regarding the reduced fare for seniors and people with disabilities, um, there's only um, a discount fare uh, available to them. Uh, in the form of a 30-day pass. Um, you know, why are the daily um, discounts uh, for every day not available, you know, in terms of the MTA fares for seniors and those who are, um, who have disabilities? And thank you for that question. It's something that's really, really important to us. Uh, one of the, the key values and core, you know, principles of, of this ferry was about increasing access and opportunity. And part of the mayor's uh, implicit direction from a very early stage was to make sure that our, our fares were as low as possible and in line with what the MTA would charge. And, and that's a significant decrease from the way uh, under, previously we had been running the East River Ferry Service where fares were as high as $6 per ride. Um, part of that was introducing discounts. Uh, and I'd like to ask if Justine can speak a little more about how some of the things, uh, some of the ways that we structured those those rates, and then what we're doing now to evaluate them. So, is that fair now? A um, dollar thirty-five uh, for seniors and people with disabilities, the same as on the subways and the buses. Uh, currently, the fare is two dollars and seventy-five cents. Again, to your point that you were making earlier. Um, the fare is reduced for people with oh, disabilities. Could you identify yourself, yes, please? Yes, Justine Johnson for me. Thank you. No problem. Um, so uh, essentially the fares are reduced, again, on the monthly passes only for um, people with disabilities and seniors. Something that we've heard as part of our extensive outreach is um, a lot, lots of feedback and requests for us to look at um, the possibility for um, another fare adjustment, whether that's for um, single rides for people with disabilities and as well as seniors. Um, something our team is committed at, lo at looking at 
um, the full fair policy for people with disabilities and seniors, and we're hopefully we'll get back with you very soon with some of our findings. And um, and currently the application for these discounts are um, are only by paper. They have to be um, mailed in. Um, and, and why is there not an electronic option? You know, um, this uh, process seems to take three to five weeks. Um, and uh, is, it, is it that you don't have the administrative or operational capacity to handle, you know, these, uh, these applications or these functions? Uh, I, this is something that's incredibly important to us, and we want to make sure that we are reaching the, the most people who would be eligible for a discount and making it as an accessible and open of a process to get there. Uh, we've been working very hard with our operator around their hardware, their IT needs, and other investments that we can collectively make to allow that process to get discounted tickets, whether it's in the form of a 30-day uh, pass that is the current discount structure and expanding it to things like a single ride now. Um, I don't have an exact date when we think we'll have that ready, but it is something we're actively pursuing. Okay. And also, just to jump in really quickly, um, as part of your question, um, yes, there are paper applications that one has to fill out, um, and we are definitely interested in working with you and as well as the community to think of ways how we can get um, applications online if possible for a variety of different users. So I will also take that note as well. Thank you. Please, uh, and I, I'm willing to work with you to yeah. make that happen Thank as you. quickly as possible. And um, as chair of the Waterfront um, Committee, uh, one of our key issues have been harbor safety since um, it's a very busy harbor. It's a shared harbor, not only with commerce and ferries and recreational boaters. A number of these sites are adjacent to some of the recreational boating sites. Um, and as you see, recreational boating has now extended out into um, the larger body of water. Um, what are you, are you looking at in terms of safety? Um, is there a person that is a lookout um, to avoid, you know, we had an accident where some kayakers were hit by a ferry. Um, so what are you doing in terms of, of safety in our shared waterways? When, when we um, initially began our, our effort to implement this system, we, we came up with a list of goals and priorities, and I've mentioned several of them around equity and access and opportunity. Our number one priority that we constantly repeat as a reminder to keep it at the top of that list is safety. Uh, something we've taken extremely seriously as well as our operator hornblower. Uh, who has an excellent track record and I'm proud to say has no incidents to date since we started New York, New York City Ferry um, around that. So w we have to work under very tight Coast Guard regulations. We follow those extensively. Um, we make sure that the vessels are equipped properly with things like cameras and rear-facing horns to better alert uh, human-powered craft that might be in the area and to use things like lookouts uh, as part of the standard operating procedure on a boat to make sure that we are being as absolutely safe as possible. Yeah. Justine, you want to say some more? Yeah, and also we've definitely had conversations with the recreational boating community. To your point, um, there are lots of recreational boaters. This is a shared harbor, and safety is very important for all of us. Um, and so part of that, we've had quarterly meetings with the recreational boating community. Our goal really is to frequent communication with each other so we all know what we are essentially what the ferry operators are looking at, and as well as for those who are on the water, what they're experiencing. Um, as part of this outreach, um, which again, it's going to be a collaborative and ongoing conversation, um, we have definitely used a lot of the feedback that the recreational boaters have provided to us um, and incorporated that feedback as part of the standard operating procedures. So, for example, we heard that, um, you know, a lot of the boaters were saying the horns are typically front-facing and we are behind the boats a lot of times and we can't always hear that. Um, as part of one of those um, recommendations that were made, we, uh, part of our standard operating procedure, um, we had now have rear-facing horns. So essentially when, you know, boaters are in the area, they can hear uh, clearly what, you know, in terms of if a ferry is reversing or, or um, operating nearby. Um, and so these are some of the efforts that we'll be making and it's going to be
to be ongoing, um, and we're really proud that we have developed this relationship with the recreational boating community. And again, outreach to the boathouses is also something that is very important to us, and we have also um, have our teams that are prepared to do outreach as well. So if you know any boaters or um, any boathouses, happy to work with you as well. Thank you. And um, my last question is, um, have you ha been impacted by any weather-related issues or extreme weather, fog, um, tides, or anything that might have impacted um, the service and, and maintaining the schedule? Um, uh, there, there may be occasional um, impacts from something like a fog, but it has been very minor to date. I, I can't recall any off the top of my head. I can, I can get back to you with an absolute confirmation. Um, but, you know, our, 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 our service is fairly resilient and has not been affected by anything to date. Because sometimes the Staten Island Ferry is impacted by extremely high tides or something. That is not something that your, your ferries experience? No. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair Rose. I want to know we've been joined by Council Members Greenfield, Levin, and Gentili. Now we're going to go to Chair Rodriguez for questions. Thank you, Chair. Following, following the safety issue that Council Member Ross asked, have you had any particular incidents in the last, since you started operating, or any report or potential moment where there has been a situation where crashes can happen between ferries? Uh, no, we have not. No. Do you feel that you have a good plan in place? We do. I mean, we've worked closely with both the operator as well as um, regulatory officials in the harbor, primarily the uh, U.S. Coast Guard, to make sure that we're operating closely. Um, we have a, a lot of a lot of boats coming in, <clears throat> both from our fleet and from other uh, private operators <clears throat> at Pier 11, and we've worked and and Pier uh, East 34th Street. We've worked closely with DOT and those other uh, private operators to make sure that we can operate safely around each other and have the right infrastructure in place to ensure that we're, we're as safe as possible. What about from the NYPD uh, role, being sure that there's a safety we, we, at a time where we have to be prepared for any potential um, act we, of terrorism? Yeah, we, we frequently coordinate. We have, we have standing coordination meetings working with the, uh, the NYPD, their harbor unit, um, and the local precincts that are located in where each of our ferry landings are located. Uh, Justine, you want to talk a little more about some of that coordination? Yeah. Um, in terms of just operating and making sure our safety is in place, we have lots of drills um, that we also do. We work with our crew and as well as with the operators to ensure that um, safety mechanisms are in place. Again, to your point about, you know, in the issues of an emergency, we've also come in handy. We've stepped in. Um, there was a boat on fire um, earlier this summer, not an NYC ferry boat, but we definitely came into play with helping with the evacuation of that boat. So we are in frequent conversations with the harbor operating community, um, and safety throughout is something that is very important to that community and frequent communications. How much has the city invest in dock and only in other infrastructure for dispatching? Uh, our, our capital budget for the, the landings is $59 million. That's for the, the new landings uh, that we put in place for the 2017 and 2018 service. What did, they, what did those $59 million allow to do? Uh, it is 10 new barges, um, the gangways that would connect those barges to the land, um, some of the operational equipment that would go on the barge from uh, canopy to the bow loaders, which effectively connect the boat to the barge, and then some upland improvements around each of those landings that would help with things um, like connection through a railing for, on a bulkhead to uh, the pathway that would connect uh, pedestrians. Uh, onto the onto the landing, some of the gates around the landing system, so we can we can uh, close it up and secure it at night, and then things like signage. Okay, so we are at the Manhattan level engaged in the whole inward rezoning, and one of the first questions that come to a rezoning is about infrastructure and transportation. As I said before in my testimony, there's five million dollars sitting there that I allocated with a plan of building a pier dock in Dagman. We did a walk, we did a tour, we had many meetings with DC. No study done, no moving done. Why? Uh, we are um, very appreciative of your support and that budget. 
Um, it is a project that we are looking forward to evaluating, but we, at this point, want to focus our efforts on launching the current routes that we have in place, and after we have completed the 2018 launches, we want to revisit uh, our opportunities for future ferry expansion and look at feasible sites like the one in your district you mentioned uh, that we look forward to uh, evaluating further. But we are not asking for EDC to put one money, one dollars. The 125th, the 125th dock have been built, standing there for a year waiting for the Columbia expansion. What I'm saying is that I put the money already with the support of the speaker, $5 million there. So even if there's no any new ferry right now, but we expecting to add 10,000 new apartment in that area in the next 15 years, why there has been more than three years, $5 million sitting there and not even started being done when I'm not asking EDC to put one cent? I, I think we'd like to understand how uh, a, a ferry dock or a terminal there could fit into a, a larger system for ferries. If that, no, if listen, I, I do understand it. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I, I, I do understand it. Okay. The 125th Dock and Peel have been built, were built like in the last 15 years, waiting for the Columbia University expansion. There was no waiting to see if the number make it. There was no waiting to see if there would be a demand of people moving from the one train. It was built. I'm not asking for EDC to include in the budget. I put the money planning for the future. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I, will, I can commit that we are. Million dollars. We did the work. We had a meeting like three years ago. Supposedly, a study will be done about the feasibility. No study has been done. I'm not asking EDC. And it does that approach in my community because I don't want to make it local to my community. What is the plan for expansion? Because uh, for me, it's only limited to some sea court. I support New York City for all, but there's a need to expand the ferry transportation also to underserved communities. Yeah. And when we are planning to add 10,000 new apartments in the next 15 years in the tip of the island, when I've been able to get a speaker to put $5 million to build it up, I don't think it's up to any of the staff of EDC to decide yet to hold the money there and not to make any more. Senator. Thank you. I'm sorry, the payment system, I'm sorry, Chairman. The payment system, what is the plan to have a centralized payment? Is there any conversation <coughs> going on with the MTA, City Bike? Do you visualize a day where there's a payment system where a one payment, a New Yorker can use a bike through City Bike, a bus and a, and a, and a, and a train, and be able also to put an period of time to be able also to, to, to use a ferry. Thank you for that question, Council Member. That's something that's been um, at, the, at the front of our minds as to how we can, I think breaking it into two questions, how we can both uh, integrate with the MTA and be on a, a shared fare system, and then two, find other modes of transit like city bike that we can better coordinate with, with our ferries. Um, I can tell you that we have worked extensively with the MTA. Um, both at a very early stage of, in our, our uh, planning of the system and then as we've, as we've progressed to where we are today. Uh, James can talk a little more about that as it comes to FAIR and as well as uh, in addition to the MTA working with groups like City Bike to see where we can find alignment together. Sure, thank you. So um, just to provide a little bit of context of where we are and how we got here, um, before we um, even announced that we were pursuing NYC Ferry, we were working um, with MTA to explore what the options might be for integrated uh, fare, for fare systems, um, starting first at the technological perspective. And when we spoke with MTA early on, we were already um, well past year 20 of the legacy MetroCard system. Their advice to us at the time was that this was a system that was getting phased out as they were already getting ready to uh, look towards replacement. And in doing so, we wanted to make conscious, uh, ma make good investments using public money and wanted to make sure that we weren't buying in, uh, ticketing infrastructure that wouldn't be useful to us in the future. So what we decided to do is actually focus on buying a very flexible kind of ticketing infrastructure that we are using, that we did speak to MTA about to make sure that 
something like this represents the kinds of feature systems they might be looking at. And in doing so, that actually gives us a lot of flexibility to integrate technically in the future. So we're looking forward to what that, for where MTA goes, and then being able to have a system ourselves uh, that is already in place and that from a technical sp perspective can be integrated. What I'm asking is, is EDC and the entity in conversation with the MTA with a plan to build a payment system where New Yorkers or tourists is able to transfer one payment system from train, buses, bike to a ferry? I think the, the simple answer is yes. We have, been, we have been and will continue to work with the MTA on how we can integrate the infrastructure, in this case the ticketing systems that we use, and how we can make sure that whatever we are using and the MTA ends up selecting that they can talk to each other and work seamlessly together. That, so is, that, is, a goal, that is a goal we share and I, I hope that we get there. So you will be fine for a new end? I will be, I'm sorry? I say you will be fine, let's say, from someone who paid a payment in a train during the whatever time, an hour or two, for someone to transfer, to transfer from that train to the ferry with the same fare that they pay? Th that would be the goal of fare integration, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. We've been joined by Council Members Deutsch and Chin. Now we're going to go on to Council Member Vaca, who was here early and ready and eager to talk to you all. I wouldn't, Vaca. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. I want to ask you, what plans do you have for Throgs Neck, Ferry Point, and City Island in my district? Um, I, thank you for that question. Um, we are, as I've stated earlier, we are very focused right now on launching the routes that we have currently planned uh, for 17 and 18. And after we launch those, we will embark on a study that will uh, revisit potential areas where we could expand the ferry system to. Uh, so that, that means you have no plans? No, that our plans Because I, our have plans asked, I have asked this question for several years. I wanted to know several years ago when the stops you announced today first were thought of, I said that Throgs Neck and City Island and Ferry Point should be included in the study. I met with all the EDC people. I spoke to the mayor. I spoke to all his people. And nothing has been done. We, we, we should talk a little more about what we looked at in, 20, in our 2013 study. I know what you looked at. I know what you looked at in 2013. I was here in the council. By, by that time, I was here eight years. It seems to me that when you come to the council, we listen to the bureaucratic speak, but we are charged with the responsibility of oversight. And when there are members, including myself, but there are others, who give meaningful input, we then, to then have that input ignored means that we are not part of a partnership. As, the, as many people think that we are. I think that we're part of a partnership when we partner with you the way you want us to partner with you. And I don't march lockstep with anyone. I want to know when is my neighborhood going to get ferry service because you cannot sit here and say anything about the MTA when the fact remains that neighborhoods that are transit deserts like mine are ignored. A vast waterfront, totally unused. And we talk about the MTA. Sure, the MTA is a problem. They've been a problem for years. But you in this city can do something about ferry service. That's in your power. The MTA, maybe not. This is in your power. And you have done nothing for my district and nothing for my community. And that's not acceptable to me. And to sit here and say that we're at the same place we were in 2013 is a load of baloney. And it's a waste of our precious time, but it's a waste of my neighborhood's efforts. I drove here today. I do not drive down to City Hall. I take the train 95% of the time, but because I'm running around, I took a car. First of all, for me to get here from Throg's Neck is a car or a bus to the train and then the train. It is one hour and a half each way. The car is no better because we are in parking lots on the FDR Drive and anywhere else we go in Manhattan. So when you tell me that neighborhoods like mine are somewhere in the future, I know that that future is 
in perpetuity. It's going to be a never situation. It's not acceptable. I want something done. What do I have to do to get something done? I can commit to you that we will reevaluate what we looked at previously, update it, and work closely with you so you can um, be fully involved in our analysis and understand exactly how we are reaching the conclusions we're reaching and let you challenge those conclusions if you disagree with them. Um, it's something but that's that happened already. I've challenged the conclusions. You've come here today with just telling us what you want to tell us, and you expect us to tell you expect us to tell you that it's a great thing you're doing. It's not. The Bronx has never had ferry service. Now you're giving us one stop. Thanks. Am I supposed to say thank you? I'm indebted to you? I'm not saying it. I think it's an outrage. And it's insulting to my community. Insulting. When all the elected officials, when the community boards, when we document our case and we ask for ferry service and you turn a blind, a deaf ear to us. So I'm sorry that the EDC, um, who's the head of EDC now? I didn't forget. Uh, James Patchett is our president. Mr. You're representing Mr. Patchett? Yes. Where is he? Uh, he is on paternity leave. He's on maternity leave. So you're right under Mr. Pageant. I, I work, I'm an executive vice president at EDC. I work in the president's office. So yes, okay. I'm, his, I'm his representative here today. Well, then you or him has to take the lead and do something and not give my community these answers. Look, look forward to working on you, uh, on it with you, uh, sincerely. We, we are happy to have uh, a very collaborative, engaging process around it. What has your survey shown? You've done an analysis Obviously, my district was passed up when you did the analysis. Why was Throgs Neck, Ferry Point, City Island, why are they not included in this plan? Why? Uh, I'd be more than happy to dig into the No, no, no. You should know now. Story. Why were they not included? I'm asking you a question on the stand. You uh, should uh, know uh, why. And, and, we're, and we're prepared to answer it for you, sir. James, well, then, I'm sorry. About that if you're not prepared to answer, then this no, is... we're completely prepared to answer. Excuse me? We're, we're prepared to answer. I was just about to ask James now, to I explain know. a little more detail. Why? Sure. So, <clears throat> um, a couple of the areas that you've talked about um, in the Bronx do suffer from some of the challenging geographies that, while they are near water, unfortunately, some of them, the actual travel time it takes to get around some of the peninsulas and challenging uh, navigational geography does make for an extremely long travel time, which is far in excess beyond when you go past Ferry Point Park, and as you've mentioned to us a few times going around the bend. But in fact, when we looked at places like Ferry Point Park, which was one of the places that we looked at um, where, uh, adjacent to Soundview, where we ultimately ended up, um, one of the things we really focused on was what, and this is the same metric that we used across the city, was how many people lived in the immediate areas around it so that we can look at who might actually ride some of these systems. In addition, because we acknowledge that Ferry Point Park is within a golf course area and that people aren't living directly adjacent to it, we actually extended in places uh, like that where we expected there to be driving people who would be driving, people who would be interested in this, and still um, did not find as much ridership demand as we saw in Soundview. So all of these things were taken into account as part of that study, and as, I, as Seth has mentioned and as we're really looking forward to in the future, is understanding what, particularly in some of these neighborhoods where it's not necessarily just a walking market, but really understanding how people are interacting with the system. So, for example, in Soundview, we understand that there may be people who are going to be driving there, and we want to know what those dynamics look like. We've been operating the East River service, which is very much a walking market, and we want to see how these things are changing. So this is all going to be really helpful information for us as we look forward to But to But we could have future. told you that in my district, you have to have a facility where people <clears throat> can park their car and get on the ferry. That's the way my district is, because we are mostly one and two family homes and more spread out. We could have told you that. That's, that's very well known. What you did before this is that you established ferry service in neighborhoods that already have very good train service. So neighborhoods that have very good train service are now getting ferry service. So those neighborhoods are going to have rents through the roof now. Everybody's going to want to move there. And then we talk about affordable housing and gentrification. Well, now we know what's going on. But neighborhoods like mine, where it's a challenge, were ignored. The city's supposed to meet the challenges. The Bronx is ground zero for inequity, that word that I hear all the time. My district's ground zero for inequity. And this is yet another example of inequity. 
If there's a challenging situation, you should address it and you should meet it. That's what we expect of city government. So I'll end it. I know the chairs want me to relinquish the microphone, but this is just unacceptable to me. And if you want to come forth with a plan, I, I'm here. But as of today, I see nothing. Not that I expected to see anything, but you saying that, there's, that we're nowhere, we're the same place we were in 2013, is a very poor indicator of where this agency is with ferry service. And this plan is not good news for the Bronx or for my district. Thank you, Councilmember Vaca. I want to note we've been joined by Councilmember Van Bramer. And we're now going to Councilmember Constantinidis. Good afternoon. Uh, so about 2,700 riders every day on the Astoria stop, Astoria route. Um, where does that fit on sort of the projection model for that particular route? Are we ahead of where we want to be? Are we behind? Where, where, how are we doing on this route? James, you want to talk a little bit? Sure. Um, System-wide, we are, as we had mentioned, reaching our ridership projections um, earlier than we thought. As Seth had mentioned, we're, we've hit our 2 million mark about two months ahead, and that does include um, some of the ridership that's just come on from Astoria. I don't have the exact uh, projection to um, on, at the route level with me, but we'd be happy to go through that with you. I know anecdotally that we've been seeing a lot of happy people coming through the Astoria route. Uh, as have I. I'm just trying to get, I mean, you know, I can sort of take anecdotes and say, yes, I think it's going great. I personally think it's going great, but I would really like to drill down um, you know, by stop, by route, and see where we are um, so we have data. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're, we're eager to see that as well, and I think um, transportation planning experts would probably caution about taking the amount of time that we've been operating right. the service to date yet and extrapolating too much from that, and we'll hopefully benefit by the end of next summer when we would have been running Astoria for a full year at that time. Uh, to go back and take a look at an entire season's worth of numbers to see how it matched up against our entire season's worth of numbers. Are there continuous outreach efforts going on, even though that it's opened, to sort of make sure that people know about this? Yeah, absolutely. Justine, you want to talk a little more about our ongoing presence there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as part of the outreach, uh, we did a heavy push, um, you know, essentially <clears throat> before the 2017 routes launched, extensive amount of community outreach. Um, we will continue to do outreach. I even get calls from community members now, um, whether they have various suggestions of how we can think through improving uh, the particular, you know, operations or day-to-day. -day. So we continue to have this open door policy um, with elected officials and community boards. Um, we have had office hours before, so essentially Hornblower has set up an office hours type of open door um, where people can come in and speak to the operator and find out more information. So um, happy to work with you, uh, and if you have uh, any other locations throughout the community that you think we should be doing outreach, we will follow up. And how close are we working with City Bike and DOT um, now that, that you know, City Bike has come into Astoria as well, about a month yeah. after uh, you know, the ferry has? How, how are we linking right. the two of them to sort of make sure we link those two transportation options? Great. And I'll pass it over to James to give you an update. Sure. We worked closely with DOT and City Bike um, in advance of the expansion to <clears> ensure that wherever we are expanding City Bike, that we are making sure that the placement of those uh, that those, of those docks are in fact cl very close to our landings. So wherever there is an expand, wherever city bike overlaps with NYC ferry, we are making sure that it's not more than a block or so that someone has to walk in order to see, if not even closer. So um, at Astoria and certainly in places like Pier 11, where the city bike is right there, um, it does provide a great last mile connection. So the last question, two questions I have um, relate to uh, one being the. Um, the boaters, uh, making sure that you know, I know that Debbie brought up the recreational boaters, but we know that's a, you know, as we seek to build a, a kayak eco launch there in Astoria uh, in close proximity, we really have to make sure that um, I don't want to talk, you know, I know the whole buoy line conversation, um, but I want to make sure we're doing something, right? I want to make sure that we don't continue to talk about talking and that we actually get uh, whatever safety measures we need in, in the water prior to uh, the kayak season next year. I know it's just recently ended, but we need to make sure that, I just want to reiterate that publicly, that we really need to kind of get this done um, before the kayak season next year. Well, we completely share your sense of, of priority on the issue. Um, we've done a lot of work, and thank you for your leadership and assistance in, in getting us to uh, in, involved in this issue and, and working with uh, those uh, people-powered or human-powered boaters. Um, you know, with, uh, with our efforts, with the efforts of our operator, 
and uh, with collaboration with the Parks Department, we've uh, done a lot to try to engage and increase awareness of it. Uh, it's something that we look forward to continuing. And I look at you know the, the radio tower there. There are some things in the community that are, sense, are a source of pride, and there are some things that are sources of angst, right? And, and that radio tower, um, it, it, it's in really poor shape. And the, op the opportunity that we're going to have to transform that into an eco launch, into a kayak launch for the community, is going to go beyond just access to the water. It's going to be an opportunity to clean up uh, a, a sort of decaying radio tower that's been there for too long. Um, so I'm really looking forward to your partnership in making sure that we can get that done and get that done on time um, and ensuring that we can have the highest level of safety. Thank you. And then lastly, um, I'll just make one last pitch. I'm gonna, I promise I'll relinquish the mic in a minute. Uh, but the, uh, as we look for newer, what, what are you know, newer opportunities? Um, I'm seeing the investment that's being made right outside my district. I can actually throw a rock across the street to uh, LaGuardia Airport from my district. Um, how are we, what kind of conversations are we having with New York State? Because uh, too many cars, too many Ubers, too many you know, cars in general come out of uh, the airport. Uh, we uh, end up on our streets in Astoria, going to the Triborough Bridge and others. How do we sort of use the ferry service as an opportunity to connect New York City with LaGuardia Airport and lessen the impact uh, on our community of, of pollution and, and car traffic? Uh, yeah, we, that was something that we looked at in our, our 2013 study and, and likely will be uh, revisiting um, as, as we evaluate it. Um, James, I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit and what we found in that, that previous study. Uh, during the time in the 2013 study, it was actually looked at um, as a market rate service, as one that people would be paying a somewhat of a premium for. Um, but what we really understood out of that and several um, sort of evaluations is that certainly for airport service, you're looking primarily to support it with high capacity modes, things that can move hundreds and hundreds of people as opposed to sort of the smaller vessels that we have, the 150 passenger vessels. So keeping in mind what the best way, these ferries, the ones that we're using, they're not a silver bullet, they're not the solution to all problems, but certainly here what you're saying in terms of looking forward to different ways to serve the airport. I mean, if you look at the Grand Central at rush hour, right, if you look at Astoria Boulevard at rush hour, you see humongous traffic jams like, and, and cars going in and out of the airport. And if we can find a way to alleviate some of that without imposing on the space in the community, without saying that we're going to uh, impact the community, but actually help the community by getting cars off the road, I think that's going to be a big step. So I hope that, and I'm happy to be a facilitator in this, I'm not just saying this here to, to sort of say this out loud. I'm, I'm saying if I'm happy to help facilitate, we need to have a deeper conversation about transit in Western Queens and, and, and finding a way to alleviate that with the ferry um, at LaGuardia Airport, I find is a big priority. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, we're now going to move on to Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you to the chairs uh, for this very important, I think, conversation uh, for the future of our waterways and. Uh, I know there are a lot of needs for expansion, and so I want to—I just want to echo those, mostly because I am a place that now has two uh, landings, NYC Ferry, and so sorry, guys, but um, we are—we are kind of seeing that beautiful uh, kind of transformation, really, of how our waterways are being used, and so I have—I um, and not only that, but for my own commute to City Hall, I. I prefer the ferry. It just puts a smile on your face, which is why I think you're seeing so much need for, for that to be expanded. I'll just throw some things that community folks wanted me to talk about. One of them is winter. People are anticipating a, a, a New York winter, New York City winter. And capacity really ranges when you can use the, the outside area versus the inside area. And so are you calculating that ridership has a fuller capacity, a higher capacity during summer times and springtime and fall, and uh, are you anticipating need for for changes? Or, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there are, there are there are boats that are full when you use the whole boat, and so when people are using this as their commute, you're gonna you're gonna lose capacity when no one's gonna want to be up on the higher outside space which means your capacity is gonna go lower, and which means that people that weren't waiting before are gonna to start to wait. This is a great conversation that happened between a writer and one of the hornblower uh, captains that I overheard and injected myself in the middle of, and I said, I'd bring it to a hearing today. So um, if you can kind of talk about winter capacity and what you're, you're thinking and prepping and preparing people for. Sure. Um, 
there, there are a couple of different aspects of how we're, we're getting ready for winter. Um, on some of the, the newer landings, we are actually winterizing the landing uh, itself, and that's something that we'll be continuing doing uh, the, the fall and into the, the all of them? early winter. All, 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 all of the new landings that we the new landings. will be winterized. Um, uh, and you, if you wanted to go see an example of that, the landing at Astoria today was uh, put in. Sir, which one? The, the Astoria. Uh, Astoria. Yep, uh, currently has that in place. Um, so that on, on that's on the landing front. There are a couple of other uh, considerations that happen in the winter. Uh, first, and James should expand on this, we do have a overall decline in the system's ridership. Uh, as, you, as you'd imagine, uh, when it gets colder, people uh, use the ferry less, and certainly any discretionary riders may not choose to ride in January or February of the year, right, versus uh, a nice sunny summer day. Um, but two, uh, and, and someone should correct me if I'm wrong, the, the capacity of the boat should not change whether people use the upper deck or the lower deck. The boat at large is rated for a, a capacity of passengers on it that's based on the ability to evacuate the boat and the amount of crew they have in life jackets, and that should not change whether people are below or above uh, the top deck. Um, but, James, you want to talk a little more about yeah, schedule I mean, and ridership changes? Sure. Um, so th that's right on the vessel itself. Um, I think what people have not seen a full boat where everyone is just inside, nobody, unless it's pouring rain or something like that. But in fact, there is space on the inside, on the interior of the vessels for the full capacity for the 150 people. Um, it may not be a seat for every person, um, but that's, the, that, that's not how we were designing things. Um, in terms of the schedules and how we're expecting winter to go, um, we do start to decline some of our off-peak services. So namely on the middle of the day, on weekdays and on weekends, we will be declining services um, in order to sort of manage what we're putting out and responsibly meeting demand that we expect. So in the middle of February, we are not going to be running every 30 minutes on some of these routes. Um, and doing that has, is what we've focused on uh, in our experience with the East River Ferry as well. One of the important things, however, is that during AM and PM commuting hours, which are really where a lot of our ridership is centered and where a lot of our focus is to make sure that we're helping people get to and from work, those schedules do not change to, based on the season. So we are providing a good full amount of service for people during the AM and PM peaks, and we expect and can, will be continuing to do that throughout the year regardless of the season. Great. And how much notice will you be giving people the changes that will be coming in for winter for yeah, we try to, we strive to give two weeks and sometimes between one and two weeks we're working right now to make sure that we're working with the operator to use as many different channels as possible. We do have a lot of very regular riders and the ones who are most affected by schedule changes are our commuters. We make sure that we get the word out, whether it's through seat cards or announcements on board, asking people to go to the website, Twitter, um, a number of channels. And then, you know, automated reminders and updates for those regular riders who use the app. Great, thank you for that. Uh, next is the um, the training at Atlantic Basin. I, I see that there's, there, it, can you confirm that there is actual training, vessel training um, at Atlantic Basin? And can you tell, tell me a little bit about, about that decision making process and uh, maybe some information that I can take back from our, to my Red Hook community about where you do trainings for, for captains and, and yeah. pilots. Um, so throughout the whole system, we actually have, um, as Hornblower, the operator, is continuing to train and build up its crew, there are regular trainings going on throughout the city. It's not just Atlantic Basin. In fact, where uh, you have um, captains who are getting, people who are getting promoted and are working to build up to those levels um, beyond the standard safe safety trainings that they're doing indoors and with simulators. They also will be doing test dockings and working with uh, vessels to actually try out at different landings as well. Can we get, can we get... Yeah. Uh, transparent just, data about where, where they're training, mm -hmm. uh, how long, et cetera? Yeah, and so essentially all the landings, there's frequent training at all of the landings. It's not just only at one place. Um, so essentially we do um, frequent checks with our crew um, and as well, um, you know, a variety of different tests um, as part of that. Can we also get uh, environmental impacts on, on the trainings. And so w was that part of the initial study or was that just a, a kind of transportation environmental impacts? I'd, uh, I'd have to go back and, and speak with our, the planners who did the, the EIS that we did um, and see what we would have assumed about trainings and whether that would fit a, a filter or a screen that the EIS would have picked up in terms of level of usage. Okay, so we can follow I, up I think you can probably assume that the, the, uh, 
concern here is that we just need to figure out how, how what the impact is to communities where there's uh, an extra boat activity that's happening, and so we want to make sure that 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 was studied, and if it wasn't studied, that we study it mm -hmm. to figure out what that impact is. Yeah, uh, it, it's making people feel a little bit nervous in places like Red Hook, where we have shore power, for example, that is not being utilized right now by the ships, uh, Queen Mary, uh, the Princess, and the, whatever the there's like a third there's a third ship that the docks in Red Hook, and none of them have been connecting to shore power. That's for another conversation, another hearing, possibly. Um, but that's a huge concern. So as people are are engaging the waterfront in a new way, more people are seeing more eyes. I'm getting a lot of concerned people about about the lack of connection to shore power. Again, we'll come up come back to that in another in another time. Uh, let's talk uh, let's talk about economic impacts. So in your in your testimony, you talked about the system will support housing development, job creation, and neighborhood growth. And so. I'm kind of interested in a very kind of particular activation question around around places like like Sunset Park and Red Hook that have maritime industrial business zones, uh, uh, zones and zoning there, and trying to figure out if if there is a hierarchy of of uh, commitment about where housing and economic development on activation of industrial business, like how, how EDC understands that, and if you can kind of talk to us about how you're thinking about it. Uh, I know the community will be ready to talk about it, is ready to talk about it, is talking about it, and it'd be good for them to hear today how you're thinking about that. I, I would say uh, it's a very thoughtful question, and let me try to give a thought. That's answer. a very what? That's a very thoughtful question. Thoughtful question. And let me try to give a thoughtful answer to it, um, which is I, I think there is a, uh, a, a desire to serve all of those needs in terms of housing, job opportunities, um, see the retention and growth of industrial areas uh, that are so important to our city's economy. And obviously, we would have to strike the right balance between some of those in places. Um, so we, we have seen the ferries as being able to connect existing communities that are in isolated neighborhoods uh, that have been traditionally underserved by the existing transit system, allowing those residents to get better access to job opportunities elsewhere in the city. Um, there's a, 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 a second middle ground where you have an existing neighborhood, um, but there's continual growth there. And you, when you look at um, growth patterns in the city and where a lot of the new housing, especially this mayor's affordable housing program is happening, so much of it is at the waterfront in areas where we're seeing that the, um, there is either uh, too little transit or the transit that is proximate to that area may either be too far away or operating already over capacity uh, as we're introducing something, uh, a new, new levels of density or additional housing there. And lastly, I think industrial fits in when you look at concerns around what you'd find in many, from many small businesses or commercial users in areas that are hard to get to, which is it's a less attractive place to get people to come, whether they're as customers or as workers, it makes it more challenging for you to run your business. So we're hoping that by introducing some of these new connections through NYC Ferry that we're allowing people to, to bridge those gaps and make those connections and support all three of those in terms of opportunity, uh, in terms of housing, and in terms of those businesses. And again, this is for, for more conversation later, but um, the, the, the kind of thing that I want to highlight in your, in your response is, is that there's a balance and so what, what, what happens in a conversation without, without talking about things like zoning changes and rezonings is that, is that we're assuming that, that we're already kind of past the rezoning and we kind of want to end with a kind of activation that is very particular uh, uh, or a priority for an administration like this one. And so what I want to do is start even before the rezoning and say what what are the community what's what's the community needs how how are we thinking about it we have 197A plans that are connected to both of these landings as well and so I, I just want to very publicly say that that's where we start the conversation as we move forward and that the balancing act happens after that conversation has been has been brought to the community with these these data points about activation and increase. Um, uh, or addressing some of these issues around um, transit deserts. And thank you for your response to City Bike. Um, I have been calling for City Bike to be placed near the Red Hook Ferry as, long, as well as other MTA lines uh, around Red Hook and Sunset Park. Great. And closer in proximity that, that can allow for winter ridership and 
other parts of the neighborhood ridership to, to the ferry. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you, Chair. You. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca, and now Councilmember Gentile. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairs, and thank you to the chairs for this, this hearing. Thank you for, for coming uh, today. I'm also on that same South Ferry line that uh, Councilman Menchaca was, was lauding, and, 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 and uh, rightfully so. Um, I am on the, um, the first stop, or the last stop, of that line, the Bay Ridge uh, uh, stop on the South Ferry line. Um, and as, as successful as that line has been, in terms of access and equity, um, there is a large swath of residents that live in my district in the lower portion of Bay Ridge near the Verrazano Bridge that have no public access means of getting to the, um, to the 69th Street, the Bay Ridge Avenue uh, ferry stop. Um, and we're talking about a distance of maybe 30 blocks, 30, 30, 30, 35 blocks, uh, where there's no access, no, 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 um, no train, no, um, no public bus to get anybody there. Parking is um, uh, almost non-existent near that, that stop at Bay Ridge Avenue. Um, so I have wondered why it is, given that situation and that large swath of people that would love, would love to use the ferry, that um, a um, shuttle bus service was not instituted uh, with this service, much as it was instituted in Far Rockaway, uh, because of the large swath of areas in Far Rockaway on either side of the ferry that were not accessible by public transportation to the Far Rockaway uh, ferry stop. Um, you recognized it there, but in terms of access and equity for everybody in the vicinity of this Bay Ridge stop, um, you have yet to recognize the need for a shuttle service. Thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, I, I, I think the, the right way to start this off before my, my preamble to James uh, delving into a little more of our assessment around when and exactly how to put in shuttle bus service, I would say it, with, with very few exceptions, we have strived to put in ferry landings that draw from a half mile radius around the landing where people can, for the most part, the vast majority of our users would walk to that landing. Um, and when we've seen a capacity or volume of people that is sufficient from that stop and then the other subsequent stops on the route that will get the boat to a, a level of capacity where we feel we can routinely accommodate the level of ridership we want to, that would be considered uh, a, a, a success and a fee, the right amount of ridership to get to. The deviation from that would be in lower density areas like the Rockaways you mentioned where we do want to collect people who otherwise would have limited means to get to that ferry landing. Um, James, you want to dig in a little more about how we assess the Bay Ridge area? Sure. Um, I mean, you, you hit on a fair bit of it, which is to say that the, um, the residential density in the immediate area is seen as the area that we are striving to support. Now, of course, people can come in from other areas, and in fact, you've highlighted some people who are looking to come in from just past there. But in general, what we have been looking for is to find um, solutions where we can serve that walking market. We acknowledge that ferries are not the silver bullet in going to fix all transportation challenges, which we acknowledge there are throughout the city, but where we think this is most effective is really to serve that walking market and people who sometimes use bicycles, which ends up being a good last mile connection. In general, we're trying not to be in the shuttle bus uh, to be running them, um, but there are, of course, a couple of unique exceptions that we've had to. In fact, as you mentioned, um, in the Rockaways at Beach 108th Street, um, it's not that the density is there and we're going farther. It's, in fact, that we're going to reach places because there isn't that density right at that location. What are the volume numbers at that location, the Bay Ridge location at this point? Um, I'd have to double check. I have to go back in to go. I, I don't have the very landing specific locations. I'm sorry not to have that with me right now. Um, but by and large, we are hitting the projections that we were expecting to be reaching across the full system, South Brooklyn chief among them. Yeah, but again, the full system, 
um, doesn't address the issue at that one stop because yeah. you you could be under uh, average at that one stop we because can, of the fact of uh, the inaccessibility of that one stop. Uh, we completely understand your question. Let's follow up when we have the information available. We're happy to follow up with the right stuff. Because I, I have to tell you, the, the people that are most harassed and most affected by the R train, and R stands for rarely, um, and that's how often the R train runs into Bay Ridge, rarely, those are the people that go all the way to 95th Street or 86th Street that would love to have the option to use the ferry instead of the R train, but cannot get to the ferry stop. We'll be happy to share the numbers we have with you and see how we can collaborate to increase the access for the ferry landing there. Great. And I've spoken to Justine about this many times over, and to Hornblower as well about this, too. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Councilmember Gentili. On to Councilmember Levin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, I just have a couple of questions about uh, the East River Ferry, um, you know, the, the, the former line being incorporated into the new system. Um, uh, with the new entity coming over to operate Hornblower, um, what we've seen, at least what I've seen personally, and I live in that neighborhood and I've heard from constituents, is uh, there have been delays, um, kind of inadequate um, uh, communication around when delays are happening and why delays are happening. Um, uh, obviously, there are times when it's overcrowded and people can't get on. Um, and as a result, my concern is that it is not seen by people that live in close proximity to the ferry stops um, as being a reliable commuter network. And that's, so all of those delays, I mean, I went one day and it was, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I went one day uh, and I was catching a afternoon ferry, it was a 350 ferry, and I had to get over into Midtown Manhattan by for a 410 meeting or something like that. and. Um, you know, there had been an oil slick a couple days, two days earlier, so it was, you know, 48 hours earlier, there was an oil slick, and so there was some Coast Guard um, presence further south on the line. But uh, the 350 ferry just never showed, and the next ferry was at 420. And so I got on the ferry at 420, and I asked the guys, is this the 350 ferry, or is this the 420 ferry? And they were like, this is the 420 ferry. I was like, well, whatever happened to the 350 ferry? I'm like, I don't know. Didn't, it just didn't show. There was no communication. They didn't tell people they were waiting, that like that ferry is, I mean, it's not like the subway where it's coming every seven minutes. It's every half an hour. And, you know, it just doesn't, that type of experience and stays with you, you know, when you're deciding how you're going to commute, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really give a lot of confidence that that's a reliable way to get around the city. And so, I realize it was early on in their uh, in their contract, but how are you? How is EDC looking at uh, the issues of reliability? How are you tracking it? And how, what are you doing to require Hornblower, or in conjunction with Hornblower, what are you doing to um, to uh, increase the communication? So at least it's. I mean, it's not a very high standard, but at least on par with what the MTA does when, a, when there's a, a delays in the subway system. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, and in many ways, uh, when it comes to capacity or crowding, um, that has been a, a, a challenge, a success-driven challenge, but a challenge that we've been working hard to address. I think, you know, unique to the East River where we had an existing uh, service, where we had an existing base of riders who were familiar with it, um, you know, and, and it, the, as the largest line, people do routinely use that and continue to use it. Uh, we want to make sure that it is reliable and reliable as possible. I think one of the biggest changes for those uh, regular commuters who used it was the, the change in the fare structure, which in all likelihood led to uh, higher you know, or increase in ridership as that became an attractive option for them. Um, throughout the summer, as we've, as we've learned more about the operations of this network and learned more about the particulars, uh, 
uh, of these routes and especially as these routes now start working in conjunction with each other uh, and how that affects um, the, the system as a whole. Um, we are seeing the need to dramatically both um, uh, b adjust our schedules and dramatically improve and increase the level of communication. Uh, that's something we, we noticed very early on in the system. Now I think under NYC Ferry we have a, a better ability to really increase substantially that level of communication than we've had previously, primarily through the app, and we want to continue to uh, push for more uh, improvements around that. I had the app on that day and it didn't say 350 Ferry not coming. No, I, I, I agree that there's a lot of room for improvement on it and we're, yeah. that's something we're driving very hard to do. In addition to the app, uh, it's, it's looking at opportunities like getting people on the ground and that's a lot, our, our operator brought in a lot of extra customer service agents as soon as we heard about initial problems like uh, the one you're uh, describing to us uh, and, and bringing out our own staff um, to get out in the field. Yeah. And in terms of communication, aware that um, in the very beginning there were some challenges with communication, um, and to Seth's point, um, we really focused on, um, one, we have digital information displays um, and are utilizing that to our best ability. Now, if we have any you know, service interruptions, um, really making sure that those delays get pushed on the digital information displays, and as well as um, moving forward to ensure consistent updates via the app so people are notified, and as well as via social media. And so, again, this is something that that we have understood that that was a challenge in the beginning mm -hmm. um, and something that we are committed to improving every day. Um, and it's, it's going to be a work in progress, but we are definitely on the path of making sure that we um, are more frequent with communications with passengers. And more descriptive. I mean, that would be also, yeah. you know, it's not just Absolutely. like there was an oil slick Correct. two days ago and mm -hmm. so expect some delays, but right. be a little bit more specific. Agreed. Yeah. This is, the, you know, this is the delay. This mm -hmm. is how long it's going to be, right. you know. Just because, again, it, you want to inspire confidence as a commuter. It's, it's nice that it's a you know a nice thing for tourists to do. It's got to be a it, you know to be seen as viable, especially with the L train and pending L train shutdown. I mean, it's got to be a viable commuter. No, we we absolutely agree. I mean, we were we intended the service to primarily. It's going to serve a lot of different people, but to primarily serve commuters. This is yeah. a, primarily a commuter ferry service. Um, we're in our survey, we uncovered that not only did we have that high satisfaction rate that I mentioned, 87 percent of the ferry users were New York City residents, um, which, is, which is great to see that people, whether they're commuting or, um, or just taking a discretionary trip or running an errand, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of them are New York City residents. I will say with, with um, using the, the digital information displays or using the app, we're striving to make sure that the information updates are in real time and people get the information as quickly and as fluidly as possible. And I think another point I want to mention around uh, evaluating and improving the operations on East River as we uh, saw this summer, you know, we, we did both modify the schedule and bring in additional supplemental vessels, not just on the peak uh, summer weekend days where we saw our system experience that enormous level of ridership and interest, but also on, on those uh, uh, more routine weekday mornings uh, where we saw routinely that the boats were, were hitting capacity and quickly brought in additional um, unscheduled boats to supplement that schedule so we could have additional capacity and make sure we weren't leaving anyone on the dock. And are you talking to the MTA and the DOT about how to work with them on uh, the L train shutdown plan? Uh, yes, we are. We're, we're in collaboration with them. Um, you know, in, in all likelihood, the ferries will be but one uh, piece of a larger uh, mitigation strategy to... So when I'm having like a community meeting about the mitigations, I can call you guys and you'll come? Uh, we, we attended your past meeting that you had, so we will continue to be a part of those meetings. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chairs. Um, just a, a couple of questions. Um, from my constituents, um, who use it as uh, uh, commuting to work, they love it. But there were hiccups um, in terms of what you heard Councilmember Levin said, you know, crowding, and then I think, um, especially with Hornbro in the, in the beginning, they didn't, I don't think they, they hired trained staff that really, because on Pier 11, uh, I represent Lower Manhattan, so there are all the ferry that stops there. And they could actually see the difference between the different uh, companies and for the, the East River Ferry, um, they, were, they needed extra help in terms of making sure people know, um, you know the time and also getting online and things like that. And, and that pier is, is pretty crowded with so much going on. 
So I think that's something that we wanted to make sure that for the commuter, um, it is a priority. Um, and during the summer, the family loves it. I mean, I've seen my constituents with their family, they're all going there, you know, they're going to the beach. Um, and it's great. Um, and so I think that there were services that were expanded um, during the summer. So I, I want to make sure that um, you pay attention to the Pier 11. Um, the other question I have is really uh, bringing the ferry service to the Lower East Side. I know that on uh, the Grand Street, um, there's going to be uh, a stop there, and that's great. We're looking forward to it. Um, but I also wanted to advocate for additional uh, stops along the way, uh, especially in the Two Bridges area, where we have one subway line, which is the F train, um, one entrance, very crowded. We have a lot of residents there. And we have Pier 36, the basketball city, uh, the pier there. And all we're getting now is party boat docking there, uh, getting you know uh, people going there to get on party boats or getting off party boats. But if that would be another site, that could be great for a commuter. Um, because we already have a pier there. Um, and then going further down, don't forget the South Street Seaport. All right? I mean, the historic area, um, Hornblower already has their, um, their pier there, the Pier 15. That is another great location uh, for commuters, uh, but also with tourists. Uh, but definitely a lot of uh, families are moving uh, into Lower Manhattan in that financial district area. Um, near the seaport, we have schools there, and it's another uh, stop where people get a quick ride um, to go to work uptown instead of walking a few blocks or, or heading off to the train that's overcrowded. So I, that's what I, I really want to advocate for, more additional stops uh, in Lower Manhattan on the East River route that would really help uh, in terms of the commuting and the benefit of that would be like job creation. You know, people are having more opportunity uh, for job training and to be able to travel uh, to their work site quicker uh, because they are not that close to the subway, especially on the low east side part. Thank you for that. Um, we look forward to looking at ways that we can leverage the, the success we've had to date um, and both to continue to make improvements but to find ways to uh, identify the right places that we can expand to and to continue a successful ferry service. So thank you for that. Thank you for your comments about Pier 11. Uh, that's probably at the forefront of our initiatives to make improvements to uh, the existing infrastructure that we had before we launched and find ways to both uh, increase the safety and the operations of that as, as well as the customer experience in terms of um, introducing uh, some additional logic to the way we queue passengers and have customer agents and other wayfinding uh, the signs that would be deployed to help make that uh, a little more intuitive to how people should navigate through it. Now, I know one question we have is that in terms of discount for seniors, are, there, are they able to take advantage of riding um, on the ferry with a discount? Uh, yeah, we do have a discount package. So we do have discounts in place. They're 50% off monthly passes for uh, uh, senior citizens and as well as people with disabilities. Okay. So um, how are you going to be publicizing um, the opening um, of the, the stop on Grand Street. Yeah, um, we're really excited about the launch of the 2018 routes. Um, and so as part of that, um, we'll do an extensive amount of outreach. I'm actually going to community board tonight to talk about um, ferry service. So I'm um, really excited uh, to continue those outreach efforts. Um, as we did with the 2017 landings, we engaged over 340 plus stakeholders um, and we continue to look forward to doing that as well. We've engaged even as young as the youngest New Yorkers through vessel naming contests where we received really awesome names like Lunchbox and Friendship Express. And we are going to um, continue that vessel naming process as well with the young New Yorkers. Um, and most recently, uh, yesterday, we uh, released the uh, um, launch the vessel naming contest for the next uh, group of vessels that will be coming online. So it is through those processes of, you know, essentially um, encouraging young New Yorkers to be a part of this process and as well as uh, adults as who are going to be taking advantage of this new ferry route. And we're happy to work with you. Um, should we do anything super fun and exciting, we're happy to loop all the elected officials as part of this process. 
Well, I want to make sure we get invited to the launch. You know, I think we missed the last one. <laughs> we will make sure that you receive an invite. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Uh, uh, Chair Rodriguez. So one question following Margaret's question. I know that you elaborated before about the discounts for the senior citizen. And the question we ask about is great that there's a 50% discount, but that's a monthly. Correct. And you say that you will work on the daily one. Mm -hmm. How soon can we expect to see the daily one in place? Yeah. Um, right now, we're, again, um, focusing on getting everything ready for, for the 2018 routes. Um, I think um, what would be likely is once we get our routes up and running, happy to come back um, with the information about uh, the fare reduction for um, one ways on the senior citizen pass. Um, if we have any additional information earlier than that, I'm happy to come back and give that information as well. But it does, it should not take you, why, I mean, what is the technology that you're using that you can uh, upgrade that technology and be able to start implementing the daily senior pass discount as today. Yeah, um, I think that's a great point that you bring up. Um, we are seeing a variety of different ways of how people uh, apply for the discount program. So some people do have a smartphone technology. Some people are using paper tickets. Um, essentially, we have to think through what is easiest um, for the person who's going to be receiving that discount and what that could look like. Um, there are a few logistical things that we need to work through. Um, and uh, once we get some clarity on that, we're happy to, again, follow up with you on that. Can that happen before three months? We'd like it to happen as yeah. soon as we can. Okay. I mean, Thanks. frankly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Let me just go into a speed round of some final uh, cleanup here, if you don't mind. Um, let's talk about the, the budgeting uh, for, the, for the ferry. Um, the city had projected $30 million in annual operating support, which was an average or anticipated per trip subsidy of $6.60. Um, just to confirm, the $30 million, that is what was actually uh, allocated in the budget for this fiscal year, is that accurate? No, that's not. That, that, the $30 million per year, we have a, um, from since we started service to, to we have a, about a six-year contract with our operator, Hornblower, and that total contract is worth $180 million. So that averages out to about $30 million a year, um, which is based on our ridership projections, how we came up with that subsidy. So the contract obligated the city to pay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. The, uh, the contract obligated the city to pay 100 mil 180 million dollars for a six-year service agreement. Is that accurate? Uh, generally speaking, yes. What is inaccurate about what I said? Uh, I'm, there are lots of different uh, carve-outs and performance payments and other other um, payments based on fuel or number of vessel hours that could change that number. Uh, and we pay in our obligations to the contractor, it's an annual uh, payment to them, or have we made uh, most of this in a lump sum payment already? Uh, we, we get regular um, invoices from the contractor. There are some performance payments that, uh, that EDC would pay once a certain um, uh, goal is achieved, and there are others that would be on a more routine, regular operation of service payment. How much have we paid to date? I don't have that number uh, right now. I'm more than happy to follow up with you. Okay, we would like that. Thank you. Um, in your testimony, you had cited a few capital expenditures uh, for barges, gangways, vessels, and for home port. By my math, that's around $196 million based on just adding up the, what was in your testimony. Um, how does that $196 million compare to what initially was projected for capital costs? Is it dollar for dollar exactly the same? Is it higher, lower? Tell us where, what the projection was and how it compares to the $196 million. Um, the, our, our initial projections when we, we started this were much more focused on the landings that we were going to put in place. Um, so we, we initially came out with a $55 million capital number that we expanded uh, to add in a additional funded project that we had in place already for um, uh, a landing investment in Astoria to come to the $59 million number. At the time we were starting uh, 
the implementation of the ferry service, we had not um, really foreseen or budgeted for the ability to do two things that came on later as we started working with operators, which was the purchase of, of the vessels from the operator and the creation of a home port. So as we uh, worked with the operator and saw the long-term financial benefits of both having uh, a fleet of set of vessels that we owned and then having a, a New York City-based home port and the, the economic benefits and the workforce benefits of having that here in the city, uh, we added those, uh, those numbers into our, our overall budget. So it was the 55 million plus additional 4 million for Astoria, which got you to the uh, the landing the anticipated number, yeah, and correct. then everything else was purchase of vessels and the home port facility. Is that that's correct? Accurate? Okay. Uh, is there any other source of funds for this other than our own uh, funds here in New York City? So the the capital investments for the landings, for the home port, and for the purchase of the boats are the city capital funds, and then the operator expense are EDC funds. Uh, so it's a, our, our corporation self funds. But nothing outside of New York's jurisdiction, state, yeah. federal, et cetera. There, there are, um, there's a, a federal initiative, and James can talk a little more about it, where we have some grant money that's going to be used in the next uh, year or two uh, for some additional landings. Yeah, we're actually going to be, um, we're in the middle of working to design upgrades to both the South Williamsburg and uh, Hunters Point South landings to bring them up to compliance with the rest of ours, which include uh, adding additional slips to those. So uh, that's using federal money um, for or input into the system. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, that's all we got for you guys. So thank you very much for your time. Thank we you. We look, look forward to collaborating with you. and. Uh, uh, I know there are a few outstanding uh, numbers. We look forward to, to seeing those, too. Yeah. Thank so, you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, I, have, uh, I have six additional uh, people who wish to testify today. We have four seats over there. So I'm going to ask the sergeants to uh, add two seats. We're going to bring everybody up together. Uh, and I'm going to ask Michael Seamus of uh, the Partnership for New York City, Roland Lewis of the Waterfront Alliance, um, Peter Ebright of the New York Water Taxi, Lauren Cosgrove of the National Parks Conservation Association, Mark Jonai, Assemblyman, Joseph Hardigan from Rockaway Civic. Um, Okay, Mr. Seamus, you're settled. We're going to start with you, and we're going to move right down the line. Settled, hanging off the... Uh... So, uh, we're usually two minutes. We're going to give a three minute, so... I'll be under two. Do what you can. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, thanks, Chair Garodnik, Rodriguez, and Rose, for having us here today. Uh, the Partnership for New York City represents the city's business leaders uh, and largest private sector employers. We work with government, labor, and the nonprofit sector to enhance the economy of the five boroughs. We support the expanded use of ferries as a supplemental component of our mass transit system. Their utility has become more important as new residential and employment centers have been developed along our long neglected waterfront. Our pa partnership fund financed the first Mike, boat. Can you speak up a little bit or sure, pull the sorry. microphone a little closer to you? Our partnership fund financed the first boat purchased by New York Water Taxi because we understood the contribution ferries could make to mobility, access, and quality of life in the city. At the same time, we would argue that the city and private companies should not be operating ferries and shuttle buses independent of the MTA. Intermodal connections, fare and transfer systems of ferries need to be integrated with the MTA. We realize the MTA has resisted responsibility for ferries, but that should not mean we give up. The city cannot afford redundant and disjointed transportation activities, and riders deserve better. Public transportation systems all over the world allow users to switch between modes of transportation using the same fare system. The city should accelerate the timetable for integrating ferry payments with the MetroCard system. In addition, it is important that ferry schedules be timed so that a rider can connect between ferries. For example, a person seeking to commute from Bay Ridge to 34th Street during morning rush hour can only take the 6.30 a.m. or 9 a.m. 
South Brooklyn ferries and reliably make a connection to the Astoria route to Midtown without significant wait time. Along with commuters, tourists have also discovered the new ferries. For example, cruise ship companies at the Brooklyn Terminal are providing passengers with ferry schedules when they disembark. This is good news. However, the city should focus on following the models of localities around the world and our own subway and bus system, which have differential fares targeted to residents and tourists. For example, in Seattle, commuters can buy a multi-ride card for 20 trips that expires after 90 days, and by doing so, receive a 20% discount off the full fare. The New York City Ferry should create a similar system by raising the single ride fare to $5 at a minimum and offering the rate of $275 only if purchasing a set of 10, 20, or more trips that can expire within a year. This will not prevent tourists from using the ferry system, but will bring much needed revenue to offset the city's subsidy of the ferries for residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you to Chairs Rose, Gorodnik, Rodriguez, and committee members. I am Peter Ebright, Executive Vice President of New York Water Taxi. New York Water Taxi has been in operation for 15 years and was sold earlier this year to New York Cruise Lines, operators of many waterborne products, such as the iconic Circle Line. Under our prior ownership, we expressed distress over the selection of the current operator of NYC Ferry and warned that it would be a danger to the existing waterborne transportation and sightseeing businesses. As it turned out, the creation of a city subsidized ferry service did bring about a consolidation of the waterborne sightseeing and transportation businesses. Some businesses fell by the wayside and others consolidated, as happened with New York Water Taxi and New York Cruise Lines. I can happily report that New York Water Taxi did find a fitting and welcoming home with New York Cruise Lines, and we do see a bright future ahead in a very different industry. That said, as with every business, there are opportunities and there are threats. Let's start with the threats. The dynamic hasn't changed with NYC Ferry. It does present a heavily subsidized competitor into our industry. New York City has a vibrant tourism economy, and many of those tourists enjoy viewing the city and the Statue of Liberty from the water. After all, it's a beautiful view, and there's something magical about, magical about being out on the water. But we cannot overlook the fact that a significant number of the passengers on the $2.75 NYC Ferry are out-of-towners and tourists who would otherwise be riding one of the non-subsidized offerings, such as New York Water Taxi. This greatly affects our bottom line. In essence, the city's taxpayers are footing the bill for the city to take business away from hometown companies with a long history on the harbor. Why buy something at retail price that reflects the product's true cost when you can get it at a deep discount courtesy of New York City's taxpayers? I would urge the city to consider a deferential fare structure that would allow regular riders to enjoy the subsidized fare while tourists pay an unsubsidized fare, as my friend over here next to me on the panel has, uh, has just mentioned. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't collaborate, I swear. Uh, now to the opportunities. New York Water Taxi is in favor of New Yorkers enjoying the waterfront, which has always been the city's great underappreciated resource. To the extent that NYC Ferry does this, bravo. It has gotten New Yorkers attuned to the reality that if you're near the water, you should be able to use it for transportation. So we're excited about the opportunities to serve those areas that are not served by NYC Ferry, either via public service or via private contract with a waterfront stakeholder. We also see opportunities to provide service during shutdowns of other systems. Over the summer, we very successfully worked with the Long Island Railroad to serve their customers when repairs were done in Penn Station. Similarly, we are ready to work with the city and the MTA to provide service during the pending L train shutdown. Any waterfront community that is not served by NYC Ferry is understandably clamming for, fer for ferry service and, as today's hearing shows, so are their council members. New York Water Taxi stands ready, enthusiastically willing, and able to provide such service. There's already sufficient vessel inventory in New York Harbor to serve any expansion needs. I thank the committees for examining these issues and welcome any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairs, Gardnick, Rodriguez, Rose, and Council Members. My name is Lauren Cosgrove, and I'm here today to provide testimony on behalf of the National Parks Conservation Association. The National Parks Conservation Association is the national advocate for all national parks across the country. And since 1919, NPCA has worked to protect and preserve our nation's national, natural, historical, and cultural resources for future generations. Here in the Northeast, NPCA is the advocate for the 10 national parks that are located within New York City. With over a million members and supporters nationwide, and with 40,000 here in New York, NPCA is well aware of the challenges that New Yorkers face when trying to get to New York City's national parks. I'm here today to encourage the New York City Council and EDC to provide bigger boats for the New York City Rockaway Ferry to meet better demand. Additionally, we want to open up isolated parts of our national parks 
located within the Jamaica Bay unit of Gateway National Recreation Area via boat access to Canarsie Pier. NPCA also highly encourages the New York City Council to continue the expansion of the ferry service so that New Yorkers can better access our national parks in New York City, especially servicing communities in the outer boroughs. Improving connections and access to New York City's national parks from the outer boroughs is one of the primary goals of NPCA. Most of New York City's national parks are located in Manhattan, and they're often accessible by public transit. Our national parks in the city consist of the African Burial Ground National Monument in Lower Manhattan, Castle Clinton National Monument in Battery Park, Federal Hall National Memorial on Wall Street, Gateway National Recreation Area in Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and New Jersey, General Grant National Memorial on the Upper West Side, Governor's Island National Monument in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, Hamilton Grange National Memorial in Upper Manhattan, the Statue of Liberty National Monument in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, Theodore Roosevelt's Birthplace National Historic Site near Union Square, and our newest national park, Stonewall National Monument in Greenwich Village, designated by President Obama in 2016. For decades, New Yorkers have had very few options to travel to enjoy New York City's largest national park unit, Gateway National Recreation Area. Gateway, like I said, consists of three units. In New Jersey, we have Sandy Hook. In Staten Island, we have Fort Wadsworth. And the Jamaica Bay unit in Brooklyn and Queens. Connections to all of these national park units, especially Jamaica Bay, from nearby neighborhoods are time consuming and insufficient. Jamaica Bay is serviced by few bus routes with minimal infrastructure to support commuting cyclists. And it's recognized in Gateway's general management plan that visitors primarily access the park by personal automobile. And once, Jamaica Bay, once at Jamaica Bay, visitors face difficulties traveling within the park because many of its attractions are physically disconnected by waterways, highways, bridges, tolls, and privately owned land. If you just wrap it up, it would be good. Okay. Um, so I, I'm here primarily to encourage to have larger boats for the Rockaway Ferry and to promote extended access to both the Canarsie Pier and Coney Island communities. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Roland. Uh, good afternoon. Roland Lewis uh, from the Waterfront Alliance, an alliance of over a thousand civic organizations and businesses. Um, I'm here to uh, report, as you heard, that the jury was out. The jury's in. New Yorkers like ferries. They love ferries. Um, the, the ridership is uh, beyond what we could have imagined. I applaud the, uh, the uh, city and Hornblower for building these new boats, the 350 uh, uh, seat boats. Um, but uh, I guess the bottom line point I want to make to you all right now is that uh, we got it wrong, or the city got it wrong in a good way. We underestimated uh, the amount of interest in ferry service. And therefore, let's take that, uh, that lesson to heart. The good thing about ferry service is that it's mobile. You can create, and it's relatively cheap. In transit dollars, you can create a uh, dock uh, for a, a couple of million dollars. That's a rounding error when you're talking about subway transit. So we can try, pilot, in lots of places, in the Bronx, up uh, uh, in Staten Island, uh, all, uh, down the west side of Manhattan. Let's try tra ferry service in those communities. If it doesn't work and that we get it wrong, really wrong, because it's underutilized, we can move it to other, other places. So that's, that's the... Uh, I think the bottom line, we have to uh, recognize, I think, that we've discovered, rediscovered a mode of transportation that New Yorkers want and need. We are, our system, our subway system is groaning under the uh, uh, number of folks that are on it. And I'm, I'm sure each of us experienced, I, I mean, this morning, a, a sardine into a car. Uh, we need to find alternatives. It's not a substitute for uh, the subway and bus system, but it is a great uh, addition. Uh, the, the other thing we got right was keeping the fare to, uh, to a reasonable, equitable level for, for New Yorkers to use. Um, another thing I'd like to, uh, to, to focus on is the uh, idea of using this waterborne the blue highway, not just for people in the day, but maybe for goods at night. There's some ideas out there that are, that are fascinating to get trucks off the road, to move your Amazon packages, to use uh, fresh direct packages. We got this, uh, the, this transit system. Um, that's uh, that's using uh, that's 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 new and uh, and has many different possibilities. Um, I, I would uh, also encourage us to use the WMAB the, uh, that's, that's to be created, recreated, uh, a governance to to think beyond the boundaries of New York City to talk about a regional approach to waterborne transit. We have 
um, two, two train tunnels that are in danger of uh, uh, being uh, compromised at any time. And if and God forbid when that happens, we will have waterborne transit. We have the L train that is going to be um, uh, rehabilitated over 18 month period. We need to have the capacity of 350 boat, foot seat boats back and forth, perhaps from North 6th Street to uh, 20th Street, maybe eight boats uh, an hour going back and forth. That kind of, uh, that kind of progressive planning uh, is what we, this, uh, this agency, the city council, and lastly, just, uh, if I may, I want to commend, um, we worked, we got a thousand signatures up in the Bronx to get the, the, fir the first and inadequately, but the, the first Bronx one. We worked with the city council representatives, we worked with community groups around the city. This is a great accomplishment of civic, political leadership, and, and the uh, folks at ADC working together and the private sector working together to, to create something new and something important. We're proud, proud to be a part of that, and uh, I look forward to expanding it. This, just, this is just the beginning. Thank you very much. Assemblyman, thank you for your patience. First of all, good afternoon, uh, Chairs Gorodnik and uh, Chairs Rose. Uh, certainly, there was, uh, it's been a long hearing and at times very passionate, uh, to say the least. But solving the lack of reliable public transportation for many areas in the city, and in particular, the borough of the Bronx, is a problem that has a direct impact on the residents, quality of life, and the local economy. It's an issue that desperately deserves the attention, efforts, and commitment of elected leaders and the agencies that have oversight. For these reasons, I strongly support the expansion of the new citywide ferry service to include communities along the Bronx coastal line. While the city's current plan includes Soundview, it's essential that the city expands that service to the other areas that are in desperate need for a mass transit solution, such as Drog's Neck, Ferry Point, and Orchard Beach. And while we must continue to look for ways to upgrade and improve the district's current mass transportation infrastructure, such as moving forward with the proposed Morris Park and Park Chester Metro North Stops, revamping the dilapidated Pelham Station and improving the efficiencies and availability of bus routes and express bus service that currently move as low as five miles per hour during rush hour, exploring ways to ease traffic congestion to improve flow of major roadways, the expansion of the city's ferry service represents the best alternative to provide relatively immediate relief to areas that are already dubbed as transportation deserts. Unfortunately, this sounds more and more like the tale of two boroughs. We're either one city or we're not. Citywide transportation funding should be based on need and urgency, not in a system that seems to favor allocating $4 billion to Second Avenue subway lines or the $2.5 billion Brooklyn Queens trolley service when it is virtually impossible for Bronx sites in transit starved areas to have reliable transportation to take them to Manhattan, other parts of the Bronx, or the city. And I will add this morning on my commute into the city, it was quite disturbing as I sat in bumper to bumper traffic. As I looked to my left, I saw open waters that would be clearly an option that we could use in those turn of transportation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Joe Hardigan from Rockaway. I'm probably the longest ferry advocate in this room for over 23 years. You can take everybody from the Metropolitan Waterfront, and I have more time than they do. Okay, first off, this is the biggest investment in Rockaway. So if any negative comment I make, the mayor's the biggest investment. Rockaway is poised to be the number one tourist destination in the country. Uh, having said that, let's take the Staten Island Ferry. Why is the Staten Island Ferry still free? If we charge for, people, for tourists, no one in Staten Island should have a double fare, though and no one in Staten Island should have more than a 45-minute commute. Give you an example. $223 million for three new ferry boats, and I was a former fire, New York City fire lieutenant. Those boats cannot be used anywhere else in the city in an emergency. They can't dock anywhere else but from Staten Island back and forth. For $223 million, I can buy 10 600-passenger ferry boats, knock a third of the commute time to Staten Island. I can also buy 20 340 passenger ferry boats and have ferry service up and running throughout the city within less than a year and a half. Period. That's it. I, I, I don't understand. I attended this city council meeting. I attended it one year ago. I attended one five years ago. And it's the same nonsense. New York City, I gave you two letters. One is ferry service that makes CENTS and how it's throughout the, throughout the five boroughs. The other one is a notice of claim. 
when they, what the EDC forgot to tell you, the reason why they went for 149 passenger boats, because I actually read the uh, Coast Guard regulations and the contract is 186 pages. If you use a 149 passenger ferry boat, you don't have to have a security guard at the dock. That's why they did it. Even in Rockaway, they didn't even look at their past numbers. That Sea Street, when they had the ferry, took away the 149 passenger ferry boat. What I recommend to you to do is get another ferry operator, get, get New York Water Taxi, get Sea Street, and sit down with them and say, what would it cost to do that? So anyway, Staten Island is great. They get over 400 express buses. If you ever think about running for another public office and you want to be Queensborough president, you, you're my lady. Staten Island gets everything. The Staten Island Ferry should not be free, period. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you might see some disagreement on some from some oh, members okay. of the panel on that well, one. One, uh, one, one, one last point. That's right. One third of the Staten Island Ferry is state money. So you should be calling your state representatives and say, how about forking over $30 million? So uh, thank you very much. Um, Okay, thank you all for your testimony. We appreciate it. Actually, I said that you, you, you're, you guys are free. I, I said this was the last panel, but we did have one additional person come in uh, in the midst. So I'm just going to call uh, Alexandra Silversmith uh, from the Alliance for Coney Island. Uh, Ms. Silversmith, come have a seat, and you will be the, uh, the last word of the day. So if there's anybody else who wants to testify, this is your moment. Going once, going twice. Okay, that's it, Ms. Silversmith. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexandra Silversmith, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak about ferry service. I am the executive director of the Alliance for Coney Island, and our nonprofit seeks to continue the revitalization of Coney Island and improve quality of life. I'm here today to express our support for citywide ferry service in Coney Island. We believe that Coney Island as a neighborhood and destination on the waterfront is particularly in need of this service. It has been five years since Superstorm Sandy, and in those five years, we have witnessed the city of New York expand, grow, and modernize to meet the needs of all of its communities. During this time, we have also seen the introduction of citywide ferry service. Confronted by transportation-starved neighborhoods, the city has used ferries to increase economic viability of these neighborhoods, as well as improve quality of life of its residents who had long been underserved by transit options. And while we applaud the city for their swift implementation of the ferry service in isolated communities, many of the businesses, residents, and visitors of Coney Island are frustrated by the fact that their neighborhood was overlooked. This past summer, a very striking view from the boardwalk was not amazing sand sculptures, but rather the countless ferries that would float by the beach to the Rockaways. Watching ferry after ferry go by, one thinks, why doesn't the city believe that this is a necessity for us? We are a neighborhood in need of transit equity. As you know, Coney Island has seen growth in recent years because of both city and private investment, but we have yet to receive or to reach our fullest potential because of unequal access to services, such as transportation. With over 5 million visitors annually and a growing neighborhood, the lack of transit options is putting a toll on the peninsula's businesses and residents. In order to ensure both current and future residents on the peninsula have equal access to job opportunities and city services, investment in transportation is essential. The growth and economic success of the businesses also is requiring increased transit options. We urge the city to follow through on studying Coding Island and adding the neighborhood to the ferry plan to ensure that current and future residents, visitors, and businesses are part of a prospering neighborhood for decades to come. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much. We're going to let that be the last word for today. Um, uh, Chair Rose, thank you for uh, your uh, uh, collaboration today, and of course all of the staff who helped us put this together, uh, to Chair Rodriguez and to members of the committee. Uh, obviously, we have a, a, an important moment uh, in, uh, in history for our transportation infrastructure here. Uh, we have some uh, open questions, uh, some issues of geography, new routes, new stops, and things like that. Uh, we also have uh, questions about um, how to make sure that the system is functioning properly and is timely and is able to deliver a reliable product for New Yorkers. So uh, I am very pleased that we had the hearing today and we'll look forward to a continued conversation with EDC uh, and DOT. And with that, we are adjourned.